The Horses by Ted Hughes is a really beautiful poem. It's um, quite abstract, so the imagery of it is a little bit difficult to visualize at first. But um, yeah, I really, really love this poem. I think it's one of my favorite Ted Hughes's poems. So we're going to delve into it and uh, explain it in this lesson in detail. So the, the first thing that's a bit difficult is just the vocab. So take a minute to kind of pause and look through this vocab. I think megalith is a very important word to understand what megalithic structures are. They're kind of like old prehistoric um, stone structures. So things like Stonehenge, maybe, I think you might call a megalith, those types of things. So very, very giant structures made um, in ancient times with large stones. There's a lot of kind of ancientness to this poem in general and a, a feeling of like, you know, primitivism or ancient knowledge, ancient kind of hidden power of the land. Hughes really likes those themes and he, he kind of cross-references them through a range of different uh, modern sort of experiences and encounters. So a lot of Hughes poems where he goes into the natural landscape and he encounters something wild the thing that he encounters that's wild is not necessarily just um, an animal or a creature in itself. It'll be a symbol for something more ancient, like a representation of the ancient power of Earth. So, yeah, this is one of those types of, of poems. It's very dramatic and it's a, a narrative poem. So I want you to just read the poem aloud and see if you can understand the bits that are building up tension and creating drama, you might want to underline and you also want to see if you can figure out the whole story. So what is the story of the speaker? What does the speaker go through as he experiences, um, you know, the, the world of the poem? So, um, yeah, I'll give you a minute just to pause, read the poem aloud to yourself and try and just figure out the basic story and also anything that makes it feel really uh, tense or dramatic. You might want to circle or underline those moments in the poem if you have it in front of you. So yeah, just as a sort of summary of what's going on, he's walking specifically in this kind of cold setting. So it's cold because it's uh, kind of a wintry landscape. There's ice, frost, everything's frozen, but also it's cold because it's the hour before dawn. So you might think symbolically, why does he set the poem an hour before the sun rises? What does the sun symbolize in terms of ancient uh, civilizations or societies? How do cultures relate to the idea of the sun? And what significance does it have to set the poem an hour before the sun comes up? in this kind of cold, dark world that's about to change. So he goes into this kind of um, cold, dark landscape and it's very, very still. And there's a lot of darkness all around. You can see the line of a moor. So moorland, this is a picture of dark moor. Um, the, the sort of spaces that you get in uh, kind of wild, usually quite high up places in um, the whole of, like throughout the whole of the UK, really. I grew up uh, next to something called the Peak District, which is full of moorland. So it's like um, basically very high up places where not much grows because of the altitude and the type of land that's there. So you can see it's these sort of wide rolling landscapes. Usually they're quite bleak and cold. If you've ever read Wuthering Heights, that book is set in Moorland or uh, Ted Hughes is also from Yorkshire. So he, he experienced Moorland when he was young. And then he actually loved Dartmoor. I think when he died, he wanted his ashes to be scattered on Dartmoor and he lived in Dartmoor for a while. So that that's a Moorland that's down south, but uh, the landscape reminded him of um, where he was from in Yorkshire. So yeah, this is a picture of a horse grazing on Dartmoor. Dartmoor has wild horses. So um, there's not really, I don't think there's anywhere else 
that I know of, at least in England, where there are just horses, wild ones, roaming free. It's quite unusual. Um, but yeah, Dartmoor has these wild horses, so you could just be walking along and bump into a wild horse that's not owned by anyone. So this poem's about an encounter with um, wild horses, with kind of wild natural creatures. So when he when he calls them the horses, they're not domesticated horses, they're not farm animals, they've not been uh, tamed. So there's a moor line, you can see the edge of the landscape is the line of the moor as it hits the, the sky, you know, kind of the horizon. It halves the sky ahead and the horses emerge onto the edge of, um, you know, this landscape. So there's a huge uh, group, I don't know what the word is for a group of horses. I have no idea. I feel like I should know that word. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know, it's escaped me today. Um, there's, there's a huge group of horses, whatever they're called, on the hill. And they look like ancient stones. They're standing there on the edge of the moor and you can see them silhouetted against the sky and they're all gray. Everything in the landscape at this point is varying levels of gray because the sun isn't up yet. So it's kind of like very, very low light. And they're like ancient stones. They don't move, um, but their manes are kind of flowing in the air. He calls them grey, what is it, still, it's up here, grey silent fragments of a grey still world. I really love this image. So they're kind of silent grey pieces of a still grey world. Um, really kind of beautiful, difficult to picture image. But again, he's, he's experiencing this world at a time of very low light. So there's no colours in the world around him. There's no kind of life really. So suddenly everything changes, the sun comes up, it's orange and red, it spills through the cloud and it just kind of fills the world. So this moment of greyness and darkness and silence is completely kind of cut through by the sun which um, yeah emerges in the middle of this poem and it makes him uh, sort of panic really so he turns and stumbles and feels like he's in a dream and he kind of you know keeps running he gets up to the horses and there they are steaming with sweat and morning dew, dew under the sun's rays the glitter the frost around them is cold and glittering so it's kind of like an illusion that they're gray and that they they're still they're actually you know they're real it's almost like he thinks they're they're a mirage or something and he has to run to sort of check to see if they're real yeah and they're real and they look different under the sun and they're kind of thawing out they're sort of coming to life under the sun but still they're very very still they don't make any sound and he thinks about the contrast between these horses and then the people below, the, the noise of crowded streets, all of the faces of the people. And the poem ends in a kind of abstract way, in the same way that the entire thing is abstract. If, if you don't know what I mean by abstract, maybe just look up um, the term abstract painting or something so that you can kind of visualize it. It's very kind of fragmented, broken painting that is quite hard to picture in a, a clear way, but it's very symbolic and it, a, very expressive. So I feel like the, you know, he's drawing on that tradition of abstract painting here a little bit with the way that he describes the landscape. It's not just in a realistic, detailed way that he describes it. He chooses very precise, strange details um, to help us kind of imagine this world in a more symbolic way rather than just like a realist way. So yeah, it ends in this kind of abstract way as well. He's just kind of you know, he's got this very important memory that meant something very significant to him. And he thinks about the history of the place that he's in and the way that it doesn't really change. So there's a sort of tension between the human world that's always fast paced and changing and moving and the stillness and kind of silence and strength and peace of the, the natural world that seems more stable in a way in this moment.
it's a very famous poem of Hughes's because it, it's very, it contains a lot of things that are very typical of Hughes poetry that people, uh, you know, that he became famous for. So this epiphany, this moment of realization or shock that changes the speaker's awareness of the world. That's uh, one characteristic of the poem that you could talk about. Another one is the, um, you know, kind of almost obsession with wildness that he has where he's compelled to watch nature and observe nature. There's so many Hughes poems where he's just walking by himself in nature and something random happens and he has this encounter with a natural feature or usually a natural animal, a wild animal. And that makes him think or realize something about the world that he didn't know before. Um, so there's another poem that I analyze called Rodia. And if you're interested in that particular theme in Hughes's poetry, the, the sort of mystique of the wild, uh, Rodia is another really good one uh, where he does that. He's just walking along and he suddenly sees these deer. So here he has this kind of, um, yeah, this sense of grayness, stillness, difficulty, darkness. Darkness in poetry often symbolizes lack of knowledge, lack of insight. And then the horses appear and he runs to them and they're real and the sun comes up all, all in the same moment. And all of that symbolizes insight and knowledge that he's learned a mystery or a secret about the ancient primitive natural world. Um, a secret that not many humans know. A lot of Hughes's poetry tries to communicate this kind of um, mystical knowledge of the power of nature. So yeah, we've got um, a lot of techniques here. I recommend going through in detail if you're going to do an essay on this poem or write an exam answer or anything like that. I'm just going to whiz through a few just to sort of give you a vague idea of it for now. You can also download this stuff from the scribbly.com website. So we have the whole Ted Hughes course on there. So um, I don't even know where to start. There's so much stuff. <laughs> yeah, the figurative language is important. There's everything in this poem, I think, is not just literal. We're not meant to take it literally. It's not just, oh, the man goes for a walk and he sees some horses. It's very symbolic. It means a lot more than just the basic story. So we call that figurative. So it has figurative meaning that might include the personification of nature. The frost showed its fires. It might include the uh, symbolism of the horses, gray silent fragments. They symbolize um, something a lot more than themselves. They're not really characterized or personified. He doesn't give them individual personalities or characteristics. They represent nature as a whole. And um, yeah, there's some kind of interesting little notes here as well. So the, you know, um, there's this poem by Wordsworth that is kind of similar the way that it writes about, you know, landscape, beauty, nature, um, specific kind of knowledge of the natural world. So um, yeah, read the poem by Wordsworth as well, if you're kind of interested in those types of ideas. Hughes really loves uh, romantic writers and romantic poetry, and Wordsworth is a romantic poet. So if you like Hughes's ideas and you want to know more about him in general, it's really good to just read and learn about romantic poets. They were writing a lot earlier than Hughes, so like at least 100 years, 150 years earlier. Um, but he's sort of continuing their tradition. He's kind of picking up where they left off with his poetry, which is why I think it's really great. So yeah, interesting meter. There's a mixture of trochees and iams, stressed and unstressed or unstressed stress syllables. So trochi is what we call falling rhythm, goes down. Iam is rising rhythm, goes up. So there's this kind of um, rhythm or kind of weird balance in the meter. Sometimes it's falling, sometimes it's rising. If you want to get really into the, the depth of the poem, you want to have a look at where is it using trochies, where is it using iams, why is it using those things. So it has a free verse structure generally, but then it also uses specific pieces of, of meter there. 
It also uses a lot of enjambement and sejura, so as a task, if you're wanting to do more on this poem, try and notice the bits that flow, so the lines that flow on from one to the next, or the stanzas that flow, that gives you enjambement. Sejour is the opposite, it's where the centre of the line has a full stop or a colon or semicolon and it breaks the flow of the line, it stops. So every time a poet uses enjambement or sejour, they have a reason why they've used it. So you can kind of go through and figure out those moments for yourself and then think about why has that full stop been added there? Why is that line running on? So they, yeah, they create kind of um, more shape to the poem and they help you really analyze the structure in detail. So yeah, just a little bit of, um, you know, context. This poem appeared in Hawk in the Rain, which is his first collection of poetry. Um, if you're doing the Cambridge poems at the moment, the Cambridge IGCC poems, there's a few other ones from that same collection. And if you like Ted Hughes, I recommend buying and reading that whole collection because it's, it's awesome. I remember reading it for the first time when I was at school and I loved it. I just like read it so many times. I thought it was really, really powerful poetry and quite complex. It's the kind of stuff where you read it and it doesn't make sense. And then you have to think about it and read it again and again, which a lot of people get annoyed with, with poems, but I actually really like that because I think it's, I think it's kind of boring if you just read something and you get it straight away. Like it's not challenging enough. So yeah, Hughes poetry is challenging, but it's it's really good. Like it's worth um, putting effort into it. So yeah, there's a lot of other animals. I mentioned roe deer earlier. There's also the jaguar, the thought fox. Whenever he has animals, they kind of represent something symbolic. Quite often that's something about nature, but it can also be about the human mind or the psyche. So another way to read this poem from a different angle is to think about what does it show about the human mind or our psychology. And yeah, he's always retreated to outdoor life. Like I said, he lived in, in Dartmoor for a while. He found peace um, in kind of, uh, you know, being in nature, especially in sort of by himself, hunting, fishing or with a couple of other people. And he, he had a really tough, difficult life. So it's very crazy, his life, if you're interested in him as a person. So many mad things happened to him. Some critics think it's his fault and some don't. So there's like a really interesting debate going on there. Like he, his wife also had a very, very tragic life and a tragic early end to her life as first wife. And um, she was a poet as well. There's, a, there's so much kind of like drama and magnetism and tragedy and intensity and kind of complexity and beauty to their relationship and their lives and um yeah fascinating to read all about that if you're interested but for now um the the context point that you should take away from it is basically just that he really liked nature and nature was like an escape for him and he sees himself quite strongly as a nature poet and his duty is to present nature not in a kind of like ideal, beautiful, picturesque way, but in a realistic way, like it's it's complex, it's very deep. It has mysteries that humans have forgotten because we've built societies that may, mean that we don't live in nature or in touch with nature anymore, like how we used to when we were more primitive ancient beings. So he's very interested in that primitivism and trying to recapture some of the ancient knowledge that we may have once had. Um, so yeah, for nature, for him, nature represents all of those things. If you specifically uh, are interested in this idea of megaliths that I was talking about earlier and ancient societies and primitivism, if those themes are really interesting to you, um, I would recommend looking up some pictures of megaliths or learning more about megaliths and trying to think about why would he think the horses look like megaliths it might just be that they visually look similar, but I think for him, there's a deeper significance there that there, there's a symbolic or figurative meaning. He's trying to say that something about the shape or the way that these horses are is similar to megaliths and how uh, humans interacted with megaliths in the past. So um, yeah, go into why, why did megaliths exist? How did humans respond to them? What were they for? 
and then think about how the speaker is responding to the horses because there's a, a deeper connection present there. Another task that's really, really nice, which I, I recommend all of you do actually, um, because I think the best stuff that we can learn from poetry is about ourselves and our own understanding of the world. So there's, I always try and put like reflective tasks into the, um, the lessons because they help you to really actually get some use out of the poem. It's not just, oh, this is a good poem. I have to do it for school. It's like, this is actually really interesting for my life or it's important for me and it helps me reflect and that kind of thing. So this second task I recommend all of you do. Um, and it's basically to write an account of a time where you had an epiphany, you had some kind of important or profound experience that is somehow related to the natural world. And try and try and write something poetic about it. You could even turn it into a full poem if, if you like. If you're not confident with poetry, you could just try and describe it in a more creative way. And try and think about the emotions and the psychology involved in that moment. Um, so for me, there's so many because I, I really like nature and I'm always in nature and I've had like so many disasters and problems in nature or kind of shock moments. Um, there's some funny ones like I, one time I was walking my dogs uh, through all these fields and I really really had to get through this field to get home but the field had a tiny Shetland pony which is like a really really small horse in it and this was like the most aggressive horse or aggressive pony I've ever met in my life and it just kept trying to attack my dogs and nothing we could do would allow us to like get through this uh <laughs> this field so I had to like turn back and walk like another probably two hours home rather than just like 20 minutes home through this field there was a time I was attacked by cows and I had to throw one of my dogs over a wall my poor dogs are always like on these accounts the time I went hiking and I was really stressed and sad because I'd been hiking up a mountain in Wales we got to the top and there was a freezing cold mountain lake and I jumped in, um, which is quite dangerous, but um, it reset me and it made me feel really, really like refreshed and energized. So yeah, that, that's three anyway, the two of them being attacked by animals, one of them a bit more peaceful. Um, but yeah, try and pick something like that. Maybe you went to a beach or you went camping or you went on a hike somewhere, you were in a forest. The other day I was uh, walking my dogs through a forest and we took a lot longer than usual and it turned dark and all the trees suddenly looked very spooky and I wasn't sure if I was on the right path and so it went from being a really nice walk to a um, something a little bit creepy and unexpected I suppose. So yeah anything like that where it's just like a moment in nature where it's really shifted your perspective you've had some kind of crazy experience try and write about it maybe put it into a poem so yeah there's this message as well like we should sort of get back in touch with the natural world and how it makes us feel we should immerse ourselves in nature in japan they actually have a rule about this called um forest bathing where people who live in cities have to go into the forest to sort of re reground themselves i guess so yeah, it's, it's interesting being in nature and reflecting on your experiences in the natural world. So a couple of messages just to sort of finish with the attitudes. Um, the first one is that nothing is static, even though th these horses are very still, that moment is very fleeting and it has kind of, you know, disappeared into the, the recesses of his memory. And the world changes very quickly sometimes in surprising ways as well as so the sun comes up and his mind shifts and his perspective shifts. We also have this idea that society is important and useful in many ways, but for certain people and probably Hughes would argue for everyone that the natural world is powerful in a way that society never can be. There's something more ancient and more eternal um about nature the way that nature works because it's just so there's sort of quite often in poetry 
you get these poets who feel like nature is far more powerful than humans ever could be and it's far more greater than ourselves and it's kind of a humble experience to be in nature because you realize how strong nature is and how fragile humans are whereas when we're in the middle of a city surrounded by things that give us comforts we don't have that sort of respect or kind of understanding of nature in the same way um so yeah Hughes is very much in a lot of ways like trying to get his readers to engage with that idea and sort of experiment a bit more with being in nature or regrounding themselves yeah and also the idea that nature is sort of a permanent fixture of, of our existence and also a balanced a naturally balanced fixture so it has these kind of ebbs and flows, rises and falls. And, you know, it's got winter and summer. It has all of these different variations within it. So you get you get to kind of experience different moods or uh, feelings of nature as well. Good, so I'll leave you with some uh, tasks and exercises to do here. So there's some on the themes. There's also um, some more general ones and then some essay questions uh, to practice when you're when you're ready. Um, so yeah, hopefully you really like this poem and it, it's a little bit hard to understand, like I say, because it's abstract, but hopefully it makes more sense to you. Um, if you're still a little bit confused, just keep going through the idea of like, what does it symbolize? What does it represent? Read more about it. Read about ancient beliefs and ancient societies and uh, those kinds of things as well, because I think they're very embedded within the deeper meaning of this poem. So if you understand those, then you'll understand a bit more what Hughes's point is about the horses. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening and go to scribbly.com if you want any more help with Hughes revision or English in general. Thanks a lot and I'll see you guys soon.